Do not be afraid. He who holds everything holds you. But we all get afraid, don't we? Especially when it comes to sharing our faith in Christ. Every one of us has a level of fear. And possibly as well, a level of shame. And I wish to speak this morning about the question of the sources of confidence and hope in the particular context of sharing our faith in the marketplace and elsewhere. And we're going to base it on two people, one from the Old Testament and one from the New. Daniel, as a teenager, he was captured by Nebuchadnezzar, the emperor of Babylon. And he was taken a long way away to a new culture, a new language, a new legal system, to a brilliant city that far outshone anything that he had experienced in his childhood in the very small city of Jerusalem in a tiny country in the Middle East. And so he was immersed in a new culture by traveling geographically. Most of us have not had to travel geographically. The culture has changed around us. And in my own case, the culture in which I now live is almost entirely alien to the one in which I was brought up in this country. So I haven't had to move. The culture has changed. And in that sense, we can align ourselves with Daniel and his experience. Having done something that no other world leader in government has ever done, and that is to run two empires. And when people in positions of authority maintain their godliness and their devotion to God, That is something we can learn from. But it was even more than that. Because as you see, I am old now. And I've noticed in life that as I get older, many of my contemporaries have maintained their devotion to God. They've maintained their church going. They've maintained their Bible reading privately and their prayers, but one thing they have lost long ago, and that is their public witness. Because the pressures of society have been so powerful that they have been cowed into silence. I never forget the leading mathematician with an international reputation who was sitting chatting to me and suddenly burst into tears. I said, what's the matter? He said, my colleagues have silenced me. I'd love to witness for my faith, but I don't. Political correctness has paralyzed the professional context in which I work. And many of us know that. We think twice before we speak. And certainly we think three times before we mention God because it's not a popular thing to do God in public when you've got the whole pressure of humanism against you saying, keep God private. Believe in him if you like. Although it's a crazy thing to do, but don't do God in public. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to be encouraged to do God in public and not to be ashamed of it. So we look at Daniel with interest because, you see, he not only maintained his devotion, he maintained his public witness, and that is remarkable. Remarkable especially because it started in King's College, Babylon, when he was a student there for three years. And in his first chapter, he writes to us about the things that really empowered him and gave him rock-solid stability to witness in public. And at the very start, he gives us a clue as to what held him. Even though he suffered from this 
invasion of his home country. He was taken from his parents and he was taken captive and we don't know whether he ever saw Jerusalem again. He understood that God was behind it. You see, ladies and gentlemen, we all live with two histories, really. There's the history of our planet, the big history, and there's our tiny little history. But what Daniel learned was that he could accept the pain and the hurt that was caused to him by the invasion because he knew that God was behind it. So the first lesson that kept him stable was his sense of God's government, leadership, and sovereignty sovereignty in global history and in his personal history. That's a very big thing for a teenager. Whether he realized this at the time, of course, is another matter. He certainly knew it when he was older. But if ever we are going to make an impact on our world, we'd better get this straight. There is a God who holds us in his hands. And even though our personal history may not go the way we would like it to go, and it takes a great deal of insight and faith and struggle maybe to see God behind the global history in which we are caught, this was foundational for Daniel. But why did he see God behind it? That's the important question, which he doesn't answer yet. He waits until chapter 9 to tell us why he understood that God was behind it all. Because there he tells us, weeping, that he knew it would happen. And he knew it would happen because the prophets, he'd listened to them. Most of his nation had not. The prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah, had again and again said to Judah, look, Israel's been carried off to Assyria, and if you keep compromising with the idolatrous worldviews of the pagan nations around you, you will end up in Babylon. And they didn't listen. But when they did end up in Babylon, Daniel saw it as the word of God coming to pass. He got a grip of Scripture. And in chapter 9, he tells us that he'd been reading Jeremiah. And that's why he understood the panorama of history. And so he could eventually accept that he'd got caught up in a bigger scheme than himself. And God was behind it because it was an outworking of history that was in Scripture. Have you got a grit of what Scripture says about history? Because Christianity is no mere philosophy. It's no mere worldview, although both of those are important. Christianity is embedded in history from the very beginning, but particularly in the events surrounding the life, the death, and the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ our Lord and the sending forth of the Holy Spirit and the witness of the disciples. This is history. And it's very interesting. Just recently, John Gray, in the book I mentioned last night, Seven Types of Atheism, says the real problem in our contemporary world is not Christianity versus science, it's Christianity versus history. Because he says, and he's an atheist, Christianity makes claims about history. It claims that Jesus has risen. So if he hasn't, Christianity is in serious trouble. Now you're intelligent people. And one of the things that concerns me is this, that many of us, we're bright in the exercise of our businesses and our commercial operations, and our professional lives. But we've kept at Sunday school level and below when it comes to Christianity. So when our colleagues start to question us about the big movements of history, we've got nothing to say. And as a result, we are often permanently silenced. We've got some work to do. A lot of work to do. Because none of us is going to be credible until we begin to take the foundational events of our Christian faith and facts and teachings of our faith as seriously as we take everything else. 
Because if you haven't seen it, your colleagues will see it. The world is desperate to see credible people who are authentic and who have grappled with the big questions. And it's very important that we do so. And so for Daniel, the number one thing was God is sovereign over history, but this wasn't a vague doctrine. This was an awareness of what Scripture had to say. And we need to be aware of the basic history that's behind the Gospels and their authenticity and their validity and their truth and their credibility. So that when a Richard Dawkins says, Dan Brown is contemporary fiction, the New Testament is ancient fiction, we know to say that that is absolute nonsense for this reason and that reason and the other reason. Thank <laughs> you.